that you will have fruitful collaborations today and, and deliberations, and that many exciting outcomes will emerge out of your deliberations. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for your attention. I look forward to being part of the webinar. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Dr. Zilikazi, for your very welcoming information and also informing our, our delegates that uh, Nelson Mandela is contributing significance when it comes to the issue of the Sustainable Development Goal, and in particular, goal number three, which we are going to be talking a lot about it today. So people are going to learn a lot of things, particularly what we're doing here in Nelson Mandela. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Zilikazi, for your time. I know you're very busy. We really appreciate for for you. I will, time for I will joining stay us. With, with you colleagues online um, until okay. the end. Thank you very much. No, no problem. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to ask my colleagues, uh, Mrs. Uh, Tsunovuyo Banza, to welcome to introduce our next, our first speaker for today. Good morning. My name is Tsunovuyo Banzana, and I am the science communicator at the DSI Mandela Nanomedicine Platform. Our first speaker will be Dr. Mpo Ngoope. He will be presenting on the green nanotechnology phytochemical formulations. Uh, he did his PhD at Rhodes University, focusing on the pulmonary drug delivery system for pediatric administration of tuberculosis. He is an associate researcher at the DSI Mandela Nanomedicine Platform. Thank you. Okay, good morning everyone and good evening, good day to everybody across the world. Uh, my name is Mpong Webe. I'm a research associate to Dr. Mukumadi. So today I'll be presenting to you uh, phytochemical formulations for commercial products. So basically we'll be focusing on green synthesis technology for formulations of your yeah, nanoparticles. So for the layout for the presentation, I'll start off with giving a little bit of introduction into nanotechnology, just for audiences who don't know what is nanotechnology, and then I'll go into different synthetic techniques that you can actually utilize to synthesize the nanomaterials. And then I'll speak a little bit about traditional medicines that are actually currently being used by everybody across the world. And then I'll go into commercial products that are already on the market, and also a little bit about the barriers that are currently, uh, which are the issues for commercialization. And then I'll give a little bit of conclusion. So a little bit about uh, nanotechnology. So basically nanotechnology is just uh, formulations of materials at the nanoscale. So for this materials, it can either be organic nanomaterials, it can either be inorganic mm -hmm. nanomaterials. So in terms of organic nanomaterials, we're talking about your liposomes, your solid lipid nanoparticles, even can be your protein nanoparticles. And then in terms of inorganic nanoparticles, we're talking about your gold, your silver, your iron nanoparticles. So the benefit of using these nanomaterials in terms of medicine, as you can see, on the image figure two there, we can actually use the nanomaterials to actually prevent uh, infections from spreading across the world. Let's say, for instance, you can coat the nanomaterials on the surface, let's say on the doorknob. So every time a person touches the doorknob, the bacteria that is on their hands, when they touch the surface, they just get, become deactivated. And then we move to de uh, designing of our detectors. For instance, we've got a pregnancy test kit, which is using nanomaterials. So we can just use gold nanoparticles to actually determine the analyte, which can quantify that you actually pregnant. And then we've got advanced drug delivery systems, where mostly we're using organic nanomaterials, such as your liposomes, for delivery of your different therapeutic drugs, such as your cancer drugs, and also for delivering DNA for gene therapy, and also for vaccines. And then we've got the other ones for removing a uh, pathogen from the blood. So here we can use actually uh, iron oxide nanoparticles. So basically you just get your antibody to actually identify uh, problems within the body. And then you attach those uh, problems. They say pathogens, it can be, maybe you expose yourself to airborne uh, pathogen or any aerosol chemical attack. So you can actually use those called nanoparticles to actually extract the particles or any poison that is in your blood. So basically, in terms of green synthesis, here we actually using uh, microorganisms or plant tissue to actually synthesize your particles. So what you do is that you can take a plant like normally with traditional medicine, you just boil your plant 
and then you drink it. But here we're going to actually use your plant and then you mix with the gold salt and then you can actually formulate your particles. It can other be gold, can be silver or any metallic uh, particles. So we can actually use those particles as antimicrobials. You can use them in cosmetics. I'll give you a lot of examples uh, during this presentation. You can also use them for imaging for cancer. You can also use them for photodynamic therapy. And then you can also use them for cell imaging. So in terms of herbal medicine, across the world, everybody, I think 80% of the world, especially in Africa and across Asia, they're actually using uh, herbal medication because it's easily accessible to everyone. So by using this material, people are actually avoiding going to the clinic because this is something that has been used for generations and it's been working for them. So for us, actually, you can see from the image, on the right here, you can see that actually natural products, they make up a lot of uh, drugs that are actually on the market. So basically, you just go to somewhere in the bush and then you find a plant, you extract it, and then from there, you can actually create a drug that can actually be used by everybody across the world. So with this presentation, I'm just trying to show that actually as Africans, we can actually use the plants that we already have in order to create our own products that can actually be accessible to everyone across the world. So here, like I've mentioned, we just be merging nanotechnology and also herbal medication. So by merging the two, we're actually going to improve uh, the application of herbal medicine because the problem with herbal medication, sometimes when you're taking them, they can cause cytotoxicity because there's actually no control of the dose. So sometimes you might find you're taking herbal medication and with your ARVs. So sometimes they're going to create complications. So with nanotechnology, you can actually improve the pharmacokinetics of your uh, of your herbal medication, we can also make them to be target specific to the disease that you want to focus on. And then we can also increase, um, I mean, control the release kinetics of your uh, phytochemicals that you want to administer to the body. So if you go to this website, which is Start Nano, you actually find there are over 10,156 nanotechnology products across the world that are already available. So a lot of people might be thinking that actually nanotechnology is something that is new, but you can see that this there's a big market that you can actually use the nanomaterials. So for this presentation, I'll be mostly focusing on something that is relating to medical schools or medicine and also a little bit of cosmetics. So on this slide here, one of the biggest examples will be your liposomes, which is for using the Pfizer vaccine. And then here I also have another one, which is a silver nanoparticles. So with this one, actually, you just take your silver salt and then you mix it with multiple plant extracts. And then you can actually make a disinfectant that you can actually spray on any surface. So it doesn't matter if people are coughing on that surface. Within 24 hours, it will still be active. It will keep on killing every pathogen that is on the surface. So this type of application can actually be applicable for hospitals. So you can just sanitize the whole hospital. So every time the patients, they come in, you can leave it and then the bacteria will just die every time they come in contact with the surface and then you do the same thing again the next day. And then here I'm representing the cosmetic products. We actually focusing on platinum and gold. You can do the same thing with the silver nanoparticles where you actually use it for wound healing. And then I also added some other example, which is the graphene t-shirt, which can be used for body regulation. And then you can also use your liposomes or your nanobubbles to actually deliver oxygen. You can also use it as artificial oxygen delivery system into your body, or you can deliver hydrogen for stamina. And then in terms of agriculture, you can also have your silver nanoparticles, which are synthesized using uh, green technology. And then you can actually have uh, fungicides, which can actually spray on your crops, and then you prevent any fungal infection. So you can actually protect your crops from any damage. So when you're looking into medicinal plant combined with uh, nanotechnology, on that website, like I mentioned, you can see most of the uh, materials that they're using is actually for antimicrobial activity. So here we can see that we've got a respiratory mask which contains nanotechnology. So every time, like remember with COVID, we have to keep on washing our mask or sometimes use it and you throw it away. With this application, you can actually have a mask that can actually clean itself. So people are coughing at you, so you don't have to worry about uh, the mask getting infected. And then we've got your uh, wind healing uh, nanoparticles, which also contain silver and some herbal extracts, which is used for wound healing. And then you go to dentistry, we've got also your mouthwash, which is also using silver nanoparticles and some plant extract, and also the spray that I've also mentioned recently. 
So I've also given some other examples where we can actually have copper and we can also have copper and silver. So this ones you can see that you can actually protect your surface for eight to 24 hours. So you can actually spray this on your cell phone if you're traveling so people keep on using your stuff. So you're protecting your equipment from any infection. And then you've got also your silver nanoparticles again, which is used for mouthwash. And then you've got your nano silver, which is used for boosting your immune system, also contains some phytochemicals. And then also I've got some silver nanoparticles again, which is for body cleanser. And then I also find a South African product, which is called Silver Genesis, which is also containing some silver nanoparticles and also some plant extract. So this product is actually used for different uh, skin diseases. So it's other insect, but it can also be acne or any issues that you're going to have with skin infection. So if we look at uh, this figure here, you can see these are the type of materials that are actually used in the US. You can see that silver is actually the most predominant uh, nanomaterial that is actually used in the US. So which means that silver is something that actually we can think about using even in Africa to design our own products. And then this is followed by polymeric nanoparticles. And then you've got your clay, which is normally used for cosmetics. We know traditionally most women, they just use clay for cosmetic purpose. And then you've got your protein, you've got your titanium, silicone, graphene, and gold. So the issue with these nanomaterials is that it's not easy actually to commercialize them because sometimes there's an issue with regulation because there's literally no proper protocol, especially even for the FDA in terms of commercialization of this product. And also the issue is that in terms of the safety, sometimes we've got these materials, we don't know how long they're going to degrade in the body or sometimes even in the environment. So some these are some of the issues that you need to consider when you're actually formulating this, uh, this material. But with silver, we've known that it's been used for generations. So when you're designing this uh, materials for your own commercial product. You have to choose the products that are actually already been approved, already been shown to be safe, just to make sure that your product that you're going to put on the market, you can actually be able to skip a lot of hurdles. And then the problem is that we can have poor intellectual protection. So with this thing, like I've mentioned silver, you can see it's been used across the world. So you have to make sure that whatever formulation that you're designing, it doesn't overlap with somebody else's formulation. Because when the people are going to buy your product, they're going to say, no, this other guy is cheaper. So we'll buy that other guy's patent. So I try to make sure that whatever you're formulating, you design it in a proper way that you can actually don't have any competition. And then the other issue is that we've got lack of support. When COVID was happening, when people were complaining about the vaccine, Sometimes you're also going to have the same issue with nanotechnology. That's because people are not aware that nanotechnology has been used for decades. So by making people aware that this technology is safe and it can also be applicable to everyone, we can actually get more support. So it's just about if you've got a product, try to create more marketing just to make people more aware about the safety of the product that you're working on. And then the other issue, which is a big concern, is the developmental uh, process. So sometimes when you come to scaling this project products, it's not easy depending on the equipment that you're using. But fortunately, we've got some microwave synthesis that you can actually use where you can actually control some parameters to upscale the production of your materials. So overall, I think the future is bright in terms of designing the nanomaterials. So I will encourage everybody to start thinking about being innovative and becoming entrepreneurs. We've got a lot of plants that have been used across Africa. We've got a lot of uh, minerals that we can actually use to formulate our own products and then can become rich. So that's my reference. And thank you. Okay, thank you so much, colleagues. And um, we, I forgot to tell you that you can start sending us your questions by the chat. Uh, you can write them down. Uh, we're going to have like one session that is specific for questioning. We just, because we don't have enough time, we thought like everyone write the question or send us the question through a chat. Uh, we'll take it from there. Um, without wasting of time, I'm going to ask my colleague again to join again. Uh, it's no way to introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Aiden Patterson. She has a PhD in chemistry from NMU. She is a post researcher from DSI nanomedicine. She will be presenting on nanomedicines. Her topic is a new era of medicine to combat breast cancer. Thank you. 
morning to everyone, uh, both present and across the world. It's a great honor to be here to speak with all of you today. My name is Dr. Aidan Batson, and today I'm going to be presenting nanomedicine as a new era of medicine in the fight against breast cancer. So we know that cancer is defined as a disease that is characterized by cells that grow abnormally, that can infiltrate into normal healthy body tissue and ultimately lead to its destruction. And the way that cancer cells differ to normal healthy cells is such that they can grow in the absence of a controlled growth signal. They don't comply to what is known as programmed cell death or apoptosis. They can metastasize or spread to different parts of the human body. They promote increased vascular growth towards the cancer site and they can they they can hide from the immune system as well as being energy and nutrient hungry so some of the conventional treatments for, for cancer obviously include chemotherapy radiation hormone therapy, hypothermia, which is also known as thermal ablation therapy, immunotherapy, cell, stem cell transplant, and surgery. Now, although these methods have proven to be effective and useful in certain cases, there are often very undesirable and unwanted side effects, including weight loss, bleeding, bruising, and a really a drastic decrease in the quality of life for people that are afflicted by this disease. Beg your pardon. So the worldwide cancer statistics estimates that in the year 2020, much as 19.3 new million cases of cancer being diagnosed, with as many as 10 million cancer deaths reported in the year of 2020. So now this is further estimated to rise to about 28.4 million cases in 2040, which is a 47% increase. So this is quite profound. The Globacon 2020 estimates that breast cancer was is the number one form of ca cancer that is diagnosed across both sexes, followed by lung, colorectal, prostate, and stomach cancers. So in South Africa specifically, out of all the cancers that have been diagnosed and recorded, it was found that breast cancer was the number one form of cancer that was diagnosed across the South African continent. And with this number of diagnoses that are reported or estimated to increase in coming years, and you can see how we have almost 10,000 new diagnoses that are estimated into the year of 2030. So based on the molecular features of breast cancer, it can be divided into four common groups, namely luminal A, which is estrogen and progesterone receptor positive, luminal B, which has the higher expression of the cell proliferation marker KI67, human epidermal growth factor receptor 2 positive, where HER2 is overexpressed, whereas both estrogen and progesterone receptors are negative, and basal-like breast cancer, which is hormone, and HER2 negative, which is also known as multi-drug resistant triple negative breast cancer. So triple negative breast cancer is quite problematic because it is a particularly aggressive form of breast cancer with very limited treatment options. And it represents up to 24% of newly diagnosed breast cancers with a steady increase in their prognosis and their incidence. And unfortunately, the average survival rate for this breast cancer is between 10 and 10 months to a year, which is not great um, with the available therapy um, on the market. And with a 65% five-year survival rate in cases where that tumor has been uh, isolated to a specific area and an 11% survival rate to those tumors that have metastasized to different parts of the body. Now, literature reports some of the risk factors for triple negative breast cancer, which includes, funny enough, we have a, a disparity with race. We have age that is a, um, a risk factor, weight, as well as genetic mutations that are present within the body. Now, there is obviously, and as I've pointed out, there is an ethnic disparity of triple negative breast cancer, such that it has been reported that women of African ancestry are more predisposed to be diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer as compared to women of European ancestry. Now, obviously, for a South African or even the African continent as a whole, this is a problem that needs to be addressed. 
So this is some of the statistics that, uh, that show the frequency of the diagnosis of triple negative breast cancer in women of African ancestry as compared to women of European ancestry. And you can see that the numbers are far greater. So this is a problem that needs to be addressed and it needs to be addressed now. So some of the looking at what the conventional treatments for triple negative breast cancer as it lacks these certain receptors such as the estrogen, estrogen, progesterone and the human epidermal growth factor receptors, hormonal and transfusomab based methods have proven to be ineffective. Now, the most common therapeutic uh, agents or methods for triple negative breast cancer include radiation, um, uh, surgery, as well as chemotherapy. However, these methods have their drawbacks. And some of these drawbacks include the rapid drug degeneration of that chemotherapeutic drug in the body, having drug resistance, passive or non-targeted approach. So it doesn't matter what the cell is, all of the cells around are going to be affected poor pharmacokinetics, rapid biological excretion, as well as those undesirable side effects. So obviously we need a targeted approach to be able to overcome some of these drawbacks that we are faced with. And this is where nanomaterials come into play. So we know that nanomaterials are inorganic or organic formulations that have a dimension, at least one dimension within the size range of one to 100 nanometers. So they are incredibly small particles. And due to their size, they have intrinsic features such as a high surface area to volume ratio, highly they are highly mobile, as well as exhibiting what is known as quantum effects. And how they are used in medicine primarily is as drug delivery systems. So they are able to encapsulate a drug and deliver it to that cancer site. And this is what we are wanting to do in our formulations. So here are some organic and inorganic nanomaterials that have been used and are being researched towards their efficacy in as drug delivery systems. So why do we want to choose nanomaterials? Both naturally and synthetically derived nanomaterials have been extensively employed in the research for breast cancer due to their excellent compatibility as well as their physiochemical features. And as drug delivery systems, they can improve upon several crucial aspects um, compared to free drugs, including they increase the solubility, they promote a greater in vivo stability, they enhance the pharmacokinetics of the system, they uh, promote better biodistribution, as well as promoting an enhanced efficacy in their approach. So here are some of the organic and inorganic nanomaterials that have been used as nanocarriers uh, for breast cancer research, including liposomes, polymers, dendrimers, mycels, protein-based metallic, as well as carbon-based nanomaterials. So this goes into a table representing some of the FDA and EMA approved nanomedicines and nanoformulations that are available in the market. And you can see the first uh, FDA approved nanomedicine was called Doxel, which is a pegylated liposome that encapsulates doxorubicin. And just by the year alone, you can see that nanomaterials have been on the market for years. This isn't a new thing. And to be FDA and EMA approved, it needs to go through stringent protocols and regulations in order to determine and make sure that it is safe for use. So these are formulations that have been on the market, tried and tested, with the most recent FDA and EMA approved uh, nano formulation being Tradelvi, which is an antibody drug conjugate that has or encapsulates the drug of SN38, which was used or is being used in the treatment for metastatic triple negative breast cancer. So when we talk about active and passive targeting or active targeting specifically, we need to look at the tumor micro environment of the cancer cell because this provides us with that active targeting approach. So the characteristics of the tumor microenvironment of uh, cancer cells include the high expression of vascular endothelial growth factors, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, tumor associated macrophages, and other molecules promoting the growth and metastasis of these cells. But there are also generalized characteristics of cancer cells, including hypoxia, a lower as, um, a pH or more of an acidic environment, higher interstitial fluid pressures, impaired lymphatic drainage, uh, leaky vasculature properties, as well as increased extracellular matrix stiffness. 
Therefore, the unique characteristics of these cancer cells, as opposed to normal healthy cells, provide us with a type of lock that with a specific key can be used to actively target these cancer cells, thereby making a more efficient approach. And this is what the basis of the active targeting strategy is in nanoformulations. So obviously we know that passive targeting describes the natural biodistribution of the nanomaterial into the cancer site based on leaky cell vasculature and the enhanced permeation and retention effect. But the drawback of this is such that not all of the nanoformulation will be incorporated into that cell to be able to release their drug, and the drug delivery is not selective. So unfortunately, healthy surrounding cells will also be negatively effective, which has its associated drawbacks. But excitingly enough, this is where active targeting comes in, as active targeting provides the site-specific interaction of the nanoformulation to the cancer cell based on those intra- and extracellular uh, environmental factors of that site. So it is uh, a much more direct approach so we can formulate the nanocarrier with these active targeting moieties that are able to selectively seek out these cancer cells. So triple negative breast cancer cells exhibits unique surface characteristics such that it includes the overexpression of endothelial growth factor receptor as well as folic acid receptors. But these can be seen as those potential locks that with the correct and associated key can be used to actively direct and selectively seek out these cancer, uh, these ca <clears throat> pardon, these cancer cells, therefore leaving the surrounding healthy cells unaffected. So this is a schematic that represents some of these receptors that have been found to be overexpressed on breast cancer cells, indicated here by the locks. And with the effective or the associated key can be used to, as I said, actively seek out those locks, unlocking the cancer cell and letting the nanopolis in, which is exactly what we want to do. So research actually has a plethora of examples of different nanoformulations that are being used or being tested for their efficacy towards breast cancer therapy and diagnostics. There will be too many to include in this presentation, so I've just I've extracted a few. So in um, example A, we have a liposomal formulation that was surface functionalized with a specific antibody drug conjugate, which was able to effectively and actively seek out ATR2 positive breast cancer cells. In example B, we have a liposomal formulation that had the encapsulated drugs of epirubicin and paclitaxel with a specific estrone receptor denoted there by the key that was able to actively seek out these breast cancer cells and thereby delivering the drug specifically and selectively to the target site. In this example, for reported from literature, we have a type of organic inorganic nanohybrid where we have a polymeric mycelium with a gold nano core that was able to effectively encapsulate doxorubicin by, via a pH labile hydrozone bond with a folic acid targeted receptor. And once it was incorporated into the cancer cell, it was able to effectively release the drug doxorubicin due to the acidic microenvironment of that cancer cell specifically, thereby leading to this targeted therapeutic approach. And lastly, what we have is a mesoporous silicon nanoparticle, also surface functionalized with the folic acid receptor, encapsulating the drug of doxorubicin, which I'm sure you can see has been used quite a lot. It is a very effective chemotherapeutic drug for breast cancer. And once it's incorporated into that cancer cell, due to that pH uh, acidity of the cellular microenvironment, was able to release the doxorubicin, thereby leading to the cell growth. Um, they're, they're leading to the, <laughs> my goodness, um, that the cell growth was uh, stopped, pardon. So as I can say is that the future of nanomedicines in breast cancer is bright. Um, it is very exciting that different functionalizations of the surface, different encapsulated drugs can lead to a plethora of studies and research that can be ultimately used in the fight against breast cancer. So I think my closing remarks would be that women around the world can rest assured that nanomedicines are doing its part in the fight against breast cancer. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Doc. Uh, by the way, Dr. Batterson is one of our postdocs here in DSI Nelson Mandela. And there are also a previous speaker, which is Dr. Mwepe, is our senior researcher in, in our group at DSI Nelson Mandela uh, on a medicine platform. Our next speaker also, it's our PhD, PhD student that we're co-supervising together with a uh, group in, in physiology. I'm gonna ask my colleague to introduce the name of the, uh, the speaker. Our next speaker is Ms. Itumeleng Zosela. She is a PhD candidate in the physiology department at NMU. Her presentation will be on plant-based synthesis of gold nanoparticles for colon cancer treatment. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone, um, and everyone who's joining online. Um, excuse my voice, I'm coming down with flu, so I hope you'll be able to hear me. Uh, my name is Itu Meleng Zosela. I'm a PhD physiology candidate, and uh, my study is on the plant-based synthesis of gold nanoparticles for colon cancer treatment. I'd also like to acknowledge my supervisors, Prof. Ru and Dr. M, and thank you for your support. Um, so. Um, you should be wondering why um, the focus on colon cancer. So it is expected that globally about 21.7 million new cases of cancer will be um, will be expected in 2030. But with colon cancer being the fourth cause of the rise in these cases. So colon cancer is the third most uh, diagnosed cancer in both males and in females, and it is responsible for over 8% of cancer-related deaths worldwide. Colon cancer can be classified as familial or sporadic, depending on the type of the mutation. Familial meaning that it is an inherited cancer, and sporadic meaning that it's a cancer that is caused by risk factors, such as, for to mention a few, smoking, alcohol abuse, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, your diet as well as obesity. So with this rise in the colon cancer incidence, there is a need to act more in the prevention and the treatment of colon cancer. So there are available treatments that have been mentioned before that are there for cancer, including colon cancer, which are surgery, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, as well as targeted therapy. But with these treatments, they have severe side effects and also they are non-specific, meaning that they do not only target the cancerous cells, but also target normal colon cells. And then because of this, this um, these treatments are also very expensive. So not even half of people in low-income countries can afford to get these treatments. So this is a very big issue that we need to take into looking into finding uh, colon cancer treatment that is that has less possible side effects that is more cost effective. So this is where we go into the nanomedicine. So nanomedicine has opened a new venture in the colon cancer treatments with using gold nanoparticles. So gold nanoparticles are good candidates because on their own also they have anti-cancer properties and because of their small size, they can enter the tissues and concentrate in the tissue and act as uh, killing the cells. And also they can be used in photochemical cancer treatments in biological imaging systems, such as photoacoustic imaging, fluorescence imaging, MRI and X-ray scatter imaging. Gold nanoparticles are also used in, um, in drug delivery. They can be used in, in targeting. So maybe you can target using a peg so that it targets the receptor of the, of the cancer so that you can then transport your chemotherapeutic drug right into your tissue. And then uh, gold nanoparticles, they have also shown to induce uh, cell death either through program cell death with is apoptosis or through necrosis. So um, the gold nanoparticles can be used by synth uh, by oh, sorry, gold nanoparticles can be used uh, can be synthesized by using plants. This is known as the plant-based synthesis of gold nanoparticles. So you can use different parts of the plants. You can use your fruit, you can use your stem bark, you can use your leaves 
or the flower or the fruit of the plant for the synthesis, right? So like current sustainability goals prefer the use of plants for the synthesis of gold nanoparticles because the traditional methods use like toxic chemicals in the synthesis and plants are environmentally safe. They are easily accessible. They can be found all over the world and they are very cost effective. So it is easy for you to synthesize using a plant because you do not need like the high equipment that is used in the traditional chemical and physical synthesis of gold nanoparticles. So the focus of uh, this study is to investigate the use of plant-based um, plant based synthesis of gold nanoparticles for colon cancer treatment, right? So the first thing that I have done in my study was to synthesize gold nanoparticles using stem bark of a plant. And then the characterization of the gold nanoparticles was done by using UVVIS, FTIR, DLS, and HRTEM. For the in vitro anti-cancer studies, we did a cell viability study by using Presto Blue SA and apoptotic effect study by using Caspase 37 pathway and a cellular uptake and localization of the gold nanoparticles by using HRTEM. So for the results, I synthesized the gold nanoparticles with gold salts and the stem bark extract, which is the one that looks like a brownish red thing. And then this was stirred at room temperature. And then like the change in color was seen after like five minutes with a deep purple uh, color of the gold nanoparticles showing the formation of the gold nanoparticles. Then the next step was to characterize the gold nanoparticles. So from the UVV spectrum, we can see a peak of the gold nanoparticles at 538 nanometer, which proves that there was a formation of the gold nanoparticles. And then there's your FTIR results at figure three, showing you the gold nanoparticles with the plant alone and the plant with the gold nanoparticles. So you can see there, there is a, a overlapping of the groups between the plant and the gold nanoparticles. The hydrodynamic uh, size of the gold nanoparticles was done by using the DLS showing a size at 45 nanometer and a zeta potential of minus 20.5, which proved that the, these nanoparticles were stable and they could be used for cancer uh, for, for colon cancer treatments in the lab. And then the next step was to check the, the, the shape of the gold nanoparticles with using HR temp. And mostly in figure four, you can see figure four A, those were mostly spherical nanoparticles with a few triangular shaped nanoparticles. And they showed an average size of 14 nanometer. So now moving to the cell studies. So for cell studies, we use colon cancer cell lines to treat, uh, we use colon cancer cell lines. So we treated the colon cancer cell lines with the gold nanoparticles to see if they would have any effect on the colon cancer cell lines. So we did an MTTSA to get the IC50 concentration. So the IC50 concentration is your inhibitory concentration at 50. So that is when your treatment kills about 50% of your cells, right? So we did get that with the MTT. And now we had to find what time of the treatment does the nanoparticles actually work? Does it work after an hour? Does it work after two hours? But then because with the MTT, you can only get your results after four hours. Then we decided to do a Presto Blue, which is also a cell viability assay. So we treated the nanoparticles at different time points, which were two hours, four hours, six hours, 16 hours, and 24 hours. So those were the treatment times of the, of the cells with the nanoparticles. And then we found that there, there is a linear decrease in the number of cells. So after each and after each and every two hours, there is a decrease showing that there is a, a decrease in cell proliferation, which could be in apoptosis. But then we cannot just confirm without doing a confirm. We can't just confirm that is apoptosis without doing an apoptotic study. So we did an apoptotic effect study with using three seven pathway, caspase three seven pathway. So the caspase, uh, sorry, the, the caspase 37 activity is the one that is responsible for apoptosis. So now we treated the cells with the gold nanoparticles as well as a positive control, which is 5 fluorouracil to see if the, the death of the cells was actually caused by the nanoparticles. This was also done at different time points. We did like uh, 30 minutes, but then we couldn't, uh, it was just too much data for, for the results. So we ended up only doing uh, results for each and every two hours like we did before. And then you could see there that 
the, there is an increase in the CAS phase 3 7 activity, showing that the death of the cells is actually induced by the gold nanoparticles. And then the uh, next step was to check the cellular uptake and the localization of the gold nanoparticles within the cell. So it is very important to know how these gold nanoparticles interact with the cell. Do they, they do they attack like the nucleus? Do they react with the nucleus and the plasma reticulum or the ribosomes? Like you need to know on the mitochondria where the nanoparticles work inside the cell. So we embedded uh, the cells, we treated the cells with gold nanoparticles and then we embedded them for HR10 analysis. But then from the results that we got, we did not see any cellular uptake. But there were uh, results showing that there is apoptosis because with the, there's a, the two arrows are showing you that there's the blabbing of the outer membrane. And then the one arrow is showing you the distorted, um, distorted organelles of the cell, showing that apoptosis was there, but we could not see any, any nanoparticles inside the cell. So we still need to optimize this method to see if the nanoparticles, where do they react? Do they react with the external part of the cell membrane or with the internal part of the cell membrane? So in conclusion, where we are at the moment is that these gold nanoparticles have shown to induce cell death in colon cancer cell lines. The results are promising. However, cell lines are cultured for years in a lab environment and are not induced, sorry, and, and they are not subjected to homeostatic regulations in the body. Then this study will further evaluate if these nanoparticles will cause cell death in human tumor cells that we will get. Uh, so we already received an ethical clearance. We, are, we have patients from Greenacres Hospital that will be donating their colon cancer tumor cells and will be treating them with the gold nanoparticles to see that if these nanoparticles will, will cause cell death as they did in the cell lines in the lab. We'll also be doing an animal study in rats. So the colon cancer will be induced in the rats and we'll be treating the rats with the gold nanoparticles to see if it will also have the same effect and to also check for toxicity. So um, what is the contribution of this study? So this study will contribute in assisting South Africa and African countries towards achieving the SDG3 target goal 3.4, which aims to reduce uh, the number of uh, non-communicable diseases such as cancer by 2030. The success of this study will also pave a way for nanomedic medicine in the future, and it will also provide a possible colon cancer treatment that is both affordable and effective. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ntumele. Um, uh, before Ntumele me go down, we want to ask um, Luto to come in the forward. Uh, by the way, today is Ntumele's birthday, so we feel like we want to honor her by asking one of our pharmacy students who is also close by us by Ntumele to wish her a happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Thank you so much, Dr. And uh, thank you, Mr. Tumele. Hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> I really didn't expect this, but I really want to say thank you so much for delivering such a powerful presentation. I didn't really consider colon cancer as such a huge problem in our country, but right now I'm willing to learn more about it. And also looking at you being a PhD candidate and I'm still an undergrad, I'm really, really inspired to join the nanotechnology group as, as well as to make an impact in our healthcare system because I know that there's a need and to see another woman as young as you doing such I'm really really inspired so I'm just gonna sing for you happy birthday please assist me ne? I'm going to say happy birthday to you and you guys are gonna say shabadu badu then I say happy birthday to you and you guys are gonna say shabadu badu so we go Happy birthday to you, should I do I do? Happy birthday to you, should I do I do? Ah, ah, ah. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, colleagues. Um, I'm gonna ask my colleagues uh, uh, Snowboyo to come introduce the next speaker. Our next presenter will be Ms. Gemma Kalitz, all the way from UK. 
She has an MSc in nanomedicine from Swansea University. Her presentation will be on optimizing the printability of nanocellulose alginate and hyaluronic acid-based bioinks for the extrusion 3D printing cartilage. Thank you. Firstly, I'd like to thank you all for allowing me to present my research today, which focuses on optimizing the printability of nanocellulose, alginate and hyaluronic acid-based bioinks for the extrusion 3D bioprinting of cartilage. Cartilage is largely unable to repair itself, which has led to multiple advances in microsurgery and transplantation. However, tissue deficiency and donor site morbidity limit the ability to replace and restore tissue function. Therefore, 3D bioprinting combined with nanomedicine has the potential to resolve these issues by producing functional, customized tissue replacements on demand, which is why this field of research has gained such momentum in recent years. For 3D bioprinting to be clinically useful, advanced bioinks need to be produced. The ideal bioink needs to mimic cartilage biologically, possess appropriate chemical and physical properties, and maintain the shape and resolution of the printed design. Alginate, nanocellulose, and hyaluronic acid each have properties which are desirable for potential bioinks. Alginate is a natural polymer which mimics the natural cellular microenvironment of human tissue. Although alginate has poor post-printing shape fidelity on its own, its ability to cross-link allows for gelation and therefore maintenance of shape of the 3D printed constructs. Nanocellulose is a linear polysaccharide derived from tree pulp. In addition to its abundance and sustainability, nanocellulose has good biocompatibility, pore and fiber networks, strength, stiffness, and a higher degree of shear thinning, which is ideal for the printing process. Whilst hyaluronic acid is not as cost-effective, it is a main component in the extracellular matrix of human cartilage and can therefore promote and maintain cartilage homeostasis and therefore has excellent biocompatibility. Although hyaluronic acid lacks the viscosity required for printing on its own, its ability to cross-link allows for gelation and therefore better maintenance of shape. Since the limitations of each of these bioinks are counteracted by the strengths of another, Blends of these biomaterials would likely form ideal bioinks. Previous studies have investigated the printability of alginate nanocellulose blends, but few have investigated nanocellulose and hyaluronic acid. Therefore, this study aims to optimize and compare the printability of alginate nanocellulose and nanocellulose hyaluronic acid bioink blends for the extrusion 3D printing of cartilage. The first step in the study is to blend the biomaterials and compare the bioink and prepare the bioink rather, which is then loaded into the print head. I would then calibrate the printer's axes and analyze the pressure required to push the bioink through the nozzle and create a continuous flow. I would conduct a line assay whereby three lines are printed and then measured under a microscope. These measurements are analyzed for fidelity and uniformity and compared to the nozzle diameter. A similar procedure would be used to conduct the ring assay. However, printed structures are, me are measured with digital calipers and compared to a plastic 3D printed model to assess the ability of each bioink to produce a continuous uniform ring, which maintains the height and width of the original design. A one sample t-test would be used to analyze shape fidelity and a pair sample t-test would be used to compare time related shape changes. Although it has been established that alginate has poor printability on its own, this cost-effective biomaterial was initially used to master the techniques relevant for the study. However, these results are still useful to determine which alginate concentration to use in the blend of alginate and nanocellulose. As expected, the pressure required to achieve continuous flow increased with alginate concentration. An example of continuous flow can be seen in the image below. This box and whisker plot shows how much the line width varies at each concentration. The line width should be equal to 410 micrometers, which is the diameter of the nozzle tip. As we can see, only the 5 and 7.5% alginate hydrogels printed lines with widths close to this value. This can be seen in greater detail under a microscope. Although the lines are not very uniform at 10 kilopascals, on average, the line width is closer to the desired value of 410 micrometers. 
Therefore, 5 and 7.5% alginate hydrogels were used to conduct the ring assays at 10 kilopascals of extrusion pressure. Although post-printing shape fidelity was poor, as expected from the literature, the ring assay revealed that 5% alginate prints a construct with greater fidelity to the original design. It was hoped that the stiffness of nanocellulose would improve line uniformity and shape fidelity when blended with alginate. Therefore, for this blend, after establishing the pressure required to achieve continuous flow, the line assay was conducted at this pressure and then higher pressures to examine which prints the best line. The lines were not consistent at nine kilopascals, and we can see the gaps in prints two and three. 10 kilopascals printed lines with widths closest to 410 micrometers. However, the line of print three had gaps, as you can see in the image. 11 kilopascals printed the most consistent lines, but they were much thicker than the original design. It is also important to note that the printed lines maintained their shape after time passed. Based on these results, the ring assay was conducted at both 10 and 11 kilopascals, although a more consistent ring was printed at 11 kilopascals. Performance in this assay was poor overall. I determined the extrusion pressure for the blend of nanocellulose and hyaluronic acid and then conducted the line assay. The width of lines printed at 9 kilopascals were close to 410 micrometers and lines printed at 10 kilopascals were continuous. Although we can see that there were gaps in the lines of the third prints at both of these pressures. Whilst continuous lines were printed at 11 kilopascals, they were way too thick compared to the nozzle diameter. Therefore, 9 and 10 kilopascals were used in the ring assay. Fairly consistent and uniform rings were printed at both pressures. When measured, the ring printed at 9 kilopascals maintained better height, but the 10 kilopascal print had greatest overall fidelity to the original design. Therefore, in conclusion, a 5% alginate concentration offered the greatest line fidelity and consistency and printed lines best at 10 kilopascals, but better rings at 11 kilopascals, although the quality of prints were not good overall. Both alginate nanocellulose and nanocellulose hyaluronic acid achieved continuous flow at the low extrusion pressure of 9 kilopascals. Furthermore, 10 kilopascals was identified as the optimum printing pressure for both bioinks in terms of shape fidelity. Neither blends exhibited statistically significant degradation after five minutes, which is a good sign for future use. It was found that nanocellulose hyaluronic acid produced rings with greater fidelity and uniformity at a lower extrusion pressure than alginate nanocellulose, which could be seen in the images on previous slides, which I will go back to if, if requested. Our hypothesis originally stated that strength, stiffness, and shear thinning behavior of nanocellulose would promote the fidelity and uniformity of structures printed from these blends at low extrusion pressures. Overall, this research has shown promise that uniform structures with shape fidelity can be achieved at low extrusion pressures by both blends. The ability to print patient-specific, customized designs is a major advantage of 3D bioprinting. However, this means that many structures will be made to order, which will take time to develop a design and print it for each patient. Since costs of bioprinters have reduced significantly over the past few years, bioprinters are becoming more accessible over the, all over the world. Therefore, prints should be able to reach the patients anywhere around the world within a relatively short period of time, as each country will have their own bioprinters. Cells can be damaged by the sheer stress of, of high pressure during printing. Therefore, printing has to be limited to low extrusion pressures. These low pressures may cause gaps, droplets, and missing layers, which we saw particularly in the line and ring assays of the study. Although no statistically significant degradation of bioinks over longer periods of time remain an obstacle in its use for cartilage replacements. Despite these challenges, the bioink blends explored in the study show potential for use in the 3D bioprinting of cartilage. There are some references of the background research that I undertook for the study. And lastly, I would just like to thank Professor Ian Whitaker, Tom Jovic, Lawrence Hill, and Octavian yeah. Parks from the Recon Regen team for their advice, support, and expertise throughout this research project. 
And furthermore, to Dr. Stephen Mufamadi for inviting me as speaker today, and once again to this audience for taking interest in my research. Um, I have popped my email in the chat, so if you do have further questions, then um, just feel free to pop me an email. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. I think don't go away. We're going to be having a, a Q&A session now. I'm going to ask uh, Prof. Ru to join, and Prof. Ru can come and join. Yes. I wonder if we have well, not one of the previous one, and then we will look through this. Mm -hmm. We have also um, a question from Sean Britt. Who can assist in with the marketing of the nanoparticles to commercialize the products into the African market? Um, is this part of NMU? Um, I think you have. So, Tom, we're just going to answer that question. Okay, thank you for the question, Sean. Uh, so, basically, for most research, uh, most universities, they've got uh, a hub where they do for commercialization and for patent protection. So the postgres they normally design a patent with the help of the university, and then the university will take some percentage of the PI. So the university will then uh, contact some industry to help with the production of the product that you're working on, and then they will help also with the marketing and also for pushing the product to the market. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. The, the next question comes from uh, um, Prince Lou. Considering the heterogeneity of the cancer and particular cell surface markers, would it therefore have a, to consider the development of multiple ligands uh, for nanoparticle um, targeting? So, mm -hmm. Thank you very much for that question. Um, indeed, yes, there are different nanoformulations that have multiple targeting moieties that are surface functionalized, but this would obviously depend on the chemical structure of the nanomaterial surface itself and whether the actual chemical bonds would be able to facilitate the certain receptors. But indeed, multifunctional uh, or multi-ligand surface functionalized nanomedicines are indeed possible and are indeed being researched and being used. You. I hope that answers that question. Hmm. Okay. I don't know if you're going to follow up, colleagues. Any follow up? If you're going to follow up, question. You've got a question, yeah? Okay. No, I am going to do Caspase 8 and Caspase 9 just to check if it's an extrinsic pathway or an intrinsic pathway. Okay, so this is a stand, and it's also maybe you can do this, um, maybe with the button, check the genes. Um, it looks like the genes to just have more organization that apoptosis is the current and what, um, just to have more substantial backing up that apoptosis as the current. And also, I didn't see the value of your IC50 on the slides. Um, I didn't put it in because it's an ongoing study, so I can't put everything there because I'm doing the study now, so I can have people testing with your concentration somewhere else. <laughs> Dr. Zulu, you have a question there? Okay, so we we did uh with normal cells like KMST, which are fibroblast human cells. So those are normal cells. So we did test also on the normal cells, and there was no cell death on the normal cells. So it was only causing cell death on the colon cancer cell lines. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Another question. I think it's for you. Um, I think they can answer 
it depends on the application or mostly organic ones, you normally you can put the constants. So because of their particular uh, properties, sometimes of the properties, let's say for uh, silver, for instance, uh, it's been known just as a natural itself, and it's called antimicrobial properties. So if you want to do something antimicrobial, you can probably use the, the silver. But if you want to just carry things into the body, you can just use the markers. And also you have to consider the percentage because we organic ones, the body can actually expose them. So if you want any problems with long term such as you can go with organic But if you want to have symptoms for the dynamic or for imaging, then you can go for it. So we're going to just top up that question. The answer, top up the answer. Basically, we use inorganic for more like therapy. The concept is looking for therapy. When you look in the other ones, we are focusing on delivery, like the vehicles, common thing like liposome like and polymers. So those are the considerations which we consider. Any, any more questions? Okay, um, another question for Ms. Carlett. Um, a higher pressure will, um, therefore, if the highest pressure tested in my study, I'm sorry, this is now changed. <laughs> she actually wanted the, the a previous one, one of the previous questions were, was uh, with a higher pressure, uh, will a higher pressure will damage the cell viability when these bio inks are loaded with cells. Uh, Ms. Scarlett, can she come? Uh, yes. Um, so I believe the question was basically why don't we just use higher pressures to print because you'll get better structures. Um, the reason why we can't do that is because when we eventually load these bio inks with cells and they go through the um, printing nozzle at high pressures, it'll damage the cells. So then the structure, um, the structure basically will just have either deformed or dead cells once printed. So we have to try and achieve a print at the lowest possible printing pressure. Another question from Mr. Prince is with respect to the bioprinting of scaffolds for the cartilage engineering, have you considered fresh printing for maintenance of the structure relative to the CID model? No, that's actually really interesting. Um, I have not considered that. Um, Potentially for my next study, which I'll be um, conducting in a couple of months, I'll, I could consider that. I don't know enough about the fresh printing um, in relation to my work. So thank you for that, Earl. Okay, thank you. Any, thank any you. other question? Any other question or a follow up, colleagues? Feel free to raise up the hand. If we, there's no more question, we're gonna um, we're gonna invite one of the last uh, speaker, which is actually is our sponsor. Wanted to show some showcase some of the product they are providing. So, Prof, thank you so much for the time. So, so let's let's welcome the new speaker, uh, which is uh, Shoen. Sean Brits, who is going to join us now. Just give us a second while Sean is putting everything together so he can join us now. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope you can all see my screen. 
sure if I I need a thumbs up from somebody or just to I can't see the back end of the screen. So I'm hoping everybody does see the, the presentation. Um, do I ask for a comment first before we continue? Sean, we can see your screen. Go ahead. All right, great. Thanks so much. All right, thank you, guys. Um, thank you for the opportunity today. Um, I think it's really important for us um, as suppliers sometimes to to try and get on and just um, maybe bring some new technologies. You know, we're, we're in uh, the high tech industry where we're always um, trying to get to the next level of, of testing phases of, of how to test uh, different diagnosis and things within within the, the research environment and um, I took this opportunity really to come on board today to say um, there are some really neat new technologies and some new interests that we would like to share with you guys uh, from an instrumentation point of view because it's one thing having something in theory it's another thing proving the theory um, so I think this is where we'd like to come in as a company and I'm just going to quickly show an overview video first of all of our company so I hope you guys can share uh, you can see my screen and I will just present there. So you can hear anything. I don't know if there was a volume or not. Oh, or not. There is some music in the background, so maybe um, I'll send the link mm -hmm. of this as well. Um, okay, not a problem. So there's just some music, but it's just given an overview of our company. It's on our website and on our um, LinkedIn pages and things as well. Well, that's a, a quick overview of, of SEPSI, just to run down that you, if you might have missed it. Um, SEPSI has been around for almost 36 years now. Um, we're a company that uh, falls into three different areas. So we're looking at life sciences, diagnostics, as well as the industrial sciences division. Um, and some of the products that I just thought we'd bring to you guys today is to show you the vastness of our part product portfolio. And I wanted to just mark on some really high level key instruments that talks very well into, you know, where you guys are, are talking about this research of what you guys are doing today, which is really on the cell biology and chemistries and, and high level uh, kind of um, cancer research and things like that. So one of the very important um, products that we now offer from, from Thermo themselves is a technique called XPS, um, which is the ultimate surface anal analysis system. And, you know, when I looked at um, presenting some of the products or some of the solutions that we may be interested as researchers uh, in applying for funding for some of these pieces of equipment, when I looked at this, when I looked at the biological, imp uh, the implant acceptance, um, antibacterial, the anti-fouling, uh, as well as cell promotion. Um, these kind of technologies is, is where we're wanting to look at the, the surface level um, interactions of molecules is, is really where we want to be, um, you know, down to the nano levels. And this is really one of the instruments that is uh, revolutionized. We've launched a new Nexus system, which combines multiple techniques into one, including Raman spectroscopy onto the XPS as well. So we can at one spot or one particular part of the sample we can get multiple te techniques fully automated in one system now as well so there's really a, a massive leap forward in the way we're doing surface technology or surface measurements these days um, using xps and uh, obviously hyphenated techniques so just an example of some of this would be uh, functionalized conducting of polymers for cell processing. You know, this is obviously, um, you know, the, 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 the medicines we take or we intake, there's a lot of uh, work around um, encapsulating these molecules or, the, or, the, or how do we want to encapsulate these molecules into the body and how do they translate out of the, um, the, the capsules into the body and these sorts of things as well. So really a lot of interesting studies being done with regards to the polymers industry, um, which is quite a, an interesting focus for that as well. 
Other technologies which most of you may not have seen yet or haven't seen one of our, our promotions of our uh, webinars is another technology called OPTIR. So OPTIR is a new technique that we're bringing to market these days. It's an American company that's revolutionized the way we do infrared microscopy, where we can do um, we, we actually can do uh, reflection of spectroscopy, but at the at the same um, resolution down to about 500 nanometers, which is really cutting edge. And it, um, the, the uniqueness of the OPTIR is that we can do a reflection microscopy um, without sample preparation, but get the exact data as the same as we would have done in um, transmission spectroscopy. So this is really revolutionized the way we're looking at using FTIR microscopy in the future. Um, those, of, those of you that have used FTIR, you know that it is really difficult sometimes to get the, the sample into a state of where you can actually measure it. With OPTIR now, we can do reflectance measurements on cells. We can do live cell imaging. We can do many, many things um, with this new technology, which I really believe is going to be revolutionizing the way we've been doing it. What we have done now as well is we've added Raman to this um, FTR system as well. So we could do OPTR, which is infrared and Raman at the same spot, which means we can have confirmatory uh, as well as functional measurements on the, the on the instrument itself. So a lot of information going to come to you guys shortly with a lot, a lot of this type of technology going forward as well. Talking about Raman, and um, we have also launched some new Raman uh, technologies, talking about um, pharmaceutical Raman systems. So we've got dedicated systems now for pharmaceuticals, where we do um, functional uh, measurements of active materials and uh, things directly on tablets. And we can actually show this in a form of, um, you know, the, 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 the spectral imaging, where it can becomes a chemical image of your product as well. Um, there's some really nice things coming from this uh, on Raman spectroscopy. We work with Renishaw Raman. And you can see we can do things like, um, you know, we can measure directly through the tablet as well. And we can do some things like uh, quantitative measurements now going using Raman spectroscopy as well, um, instead of just doing the surface analysis that you see here. The other things we're looking at is um, obviously we do a full range of air uh, of electron microscopy from Hitachi. So this little unit though is the next next generation of SEM platform. So it's a complete SEM as you most most of you might have seen in the laboratories, you have a full room available for scanning electron microscopes. We have now taken a normal SEM and, and compacted it into a normal wall plug-in type SEM unit, but it gives the full functionality of a, of a full SEM, um, just a much more miniaturized system. So this is once again revolutionizing the way we're looking at SEM uh, and using these high-level uh, microscopy units uh, in our laboratories. So you can see that some of the um, SEMs now on that uh, particular SEM on the FlexSEM system. It is an eSEM as well, so you can do low vacuum SE imaging. And of course, you can a click of a button, do high SEM resolution uh, measurements as well on, on one unit, which is fantastic. We, of course, do the whole range of, of Hitachi SEM and all the sample preparation equipment, as, of course, all the um, laboratory um, consumables that goes with SEM and TEM these days as well. So we do everything from the high resolution TEMs all the way down to the basic benchtop SEMs as well. Something new um, that most of you may not have seen, um, we now also have a benchtop NMR. Um, we have a multiple probe NMR, we have a, a 60, 80 and a 90 NMR, but some of you guys spoke about synthesis of chemicals. And one of the things we, we really are selling a lot of these NMRs for at the moment is when we are trying to synthesize chemicals, can we physically have a look at it through a flow cell unit of are we creating what we're creating and how can we do this? And we now have an NMR for exactly this process where we can actually do reaction rate monitoring and push our sample directly through here. And we can use NMR to physically um, have a look at the, the product that we are uh, manufacturing at this point in time or synthesizing, let me put it that way. Of course, we also do the whole range of Hitachi thermal analysis, and um, I just want to brag about that because we have now recently installed a DSC um, at, the, at the university. And of course, we do some very unique things, which is again down to um, monitoring um, the DSC or TGA or even a DMA system where we can actually do a um, a polymer where we can actually do a visual of the actual sample itself. So if we were looking at the visuals of the of the product, we can get a visual analysis of um, exactly what's happening on the sample at any given moment. And that would be in DSC, TGA um, or on, on our DMA as well. 
So really good technologies going forward. And of course, Sebsi provides everything from your uh, pipette tips to the pipette to cold storage to certification, water purification, all the general lab things you may need in your laboratory. Sebsi does offer a solution for you guys on that as well. And of course, our full range of life sciences products um, that we're offering um, as well. Any other information, by all means, go to our website. Um, info at SEPSI is where you do request any information. And of course, you may, some of you might be on our LinkedIn page and we've got a Facebook and YouTube channel. So we're launching a lot of new videos and a lot of new things coming out on, on social media. So thanks very much for giving me this opportunity today. Any Thank questions? You so much, John. Any question, colleagues? Any question about the instruments? Perhaps you want to purchase one more information about the instrument. And I'm just happy to tell you that here at NMU managed to purchase two machines from Sean, which is um, uh, Sean and for which is DSC and 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 which one? FTR and F yeah. FTR. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any any question? Right. If there is no question. I was just talking to my colleagues here that we think maybe we should allow people to take a break and go to bathroom and have some cup of coffee or some small meal. Yeah, so colleagues, we're going to give you a break. We're going to come back at 12. We're supposed to come back at 12.40, but so maybe let's come back at one o'clock just for a short break for people to, to go to bathroom and grab some food to eat. Yeah, so let's come back at, at, at one o'clock. And thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming back. We can really see a lot of, lot of you managed to join us again. Um, in our next session, uh, for those who are coming for the first time, we've already done the first session, and the advantage is that we're gonna record, we're recording everything. So should you want the full recording for the board session, you're gonna make sure we share with you. I'm not gonna waste much of my time. I'm gonna ask my colleagues to introduce the next speaker, um, Mrs. Novuyo. So Mbazana, can you can go ahead? Our next speaker is Dr. Frank Eric Tatsing Foka. He has a PhD in molecular microbiology from Northwest University. He is a postdoctorate research fellow, virology lab at NW. Northwest. At Northwest University, sorry. Um, his topic will be the potential of plant based nanoparticle synthesis as antiviral agents against SARS CoV 2. A focus on Azidarachta Indica. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for, yeah, thanks so much for inviting me to this wonderful uh, event. Let me share my screen with you guys. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, yes, we can see your screen. Okay. All right, once again, good afternoon, everybody. <coughs> so uh, I would like to particularly thank uh, Dr. Stephen for inviting me to uh, this wonderful event. It's been very insightful since uh, it started and I've learned quite a lot of uh, new interesting stuff. So uh, I, as um, indicated by uh, the, the, the MC, I'm going to uh, discuss uh, with you guys about the potential of plant-based uh, nanoparticles uh, synthesis as antiviral agents against SARS-CoV-2 with, uh, with a specific uh, emphasis of focus on Azadirapta uh, Indica. So I'm Frank Eric Tatin Foka uh, from the Norwest University, where I am currently a postdoctorate uh, research uh, fellow in Dr. Uh, Hazel Mufandu's uh, lab. So uh, here is the outline of my presentation. And without wasting any further time, uh, let's go to the introduction. So in December 2019, uh, first cases of patients uh, suffering from a rare type of severe pneumonia were reported in Wuhan city of the Hubei province in China. And early diagnostic tools revealed a novel coronavirus as the etiologic agent of this illness, which was later uncalled uh, COVID-19. After spreading worldwide and by mid-January 2020, this disease was declared a global pandemic by the World Health uh, Organization. 
and tools such as genomic assays were used to actually investigate on this etiologic agent, and it was revealed that it was a mutant strain, uh, and which was called severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2, and it was also identified as a member of the genus uh, beta coronavirus. Upon further uh, investigating on the structure of this virus, it was um, discovered that the S glycoprotein was responsible for mediating uh, the virus entry by binding to the ACE2 receptor on target cells and catalyzing fusion between the virus and the target cell membrane. And furthermore, efficient entry into the target cells additionally required S protein priming at the S2 prime site by cellular proteases such as uh, TMPR SS2. Now, can you show the, share the video? Okay, let me let me do that now. Just give me a few seconds. Okay. I think that should be fine. Can you see me? Can you guys see the video? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. So can I go you. ahead? Can I? Okay. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Dr. Point of view. Okay, so uh, discussing about uh, now looking at the the uh, the main ways of transmission, the main the main mechanisms of transmission of this specific virus, it was identified, but was identified as a natural host of uh, this uh, virus, and uh, this virus was uh, transmitted to humans through intermediate hosts such as a pangolin and snake, and it was also established that humans can actually uh, transmit this virus to pets such as cats and dogs. And other uh, uh, hosts are what we could call experimental hosts because, uh, as we all know, in the labs, uh, through experimental um, analysis to maybe study, maybe uh, through um, uh, model, modeling studies of uh, uh, the pathogenesis or maybe the, the main uh, um, therapeutic options of uh, towards this uh, specific uh, virus, experimental uh, models such as mouse, uh, hamster, ferret, and primates can also uh, be identified. But this virus, up to now, studies have not yet uh, identified a possible uh, uh, disease caused by this virus in animals such as pig, rabbit, and uh, and uh, chicken. <clears throat> okay. Now, looking at the symptoms of uh, COVID-19, some of the most uh, severe symptoms are fever or chills, cough, shortness of breath or difficulty in breathing, fatigue. Uh, loss of smell, loss of taste, headache, muscle or body ache, sore throat, congestion or only nose, uh, nausea, vomiting, and, and diarrhea. Now, in order to curb this uh, pandemic, see, uh, many measures were uh, actually implemented. For instance, safety measures such as social distancing, increased uh, personal protection equipment, wearing of face masks, regular sanitization and disinfection of inanimate objects and areas previously, previously used were actually implemented. Besides the safety measures, repurposing of drugs such as bromexine, ivermectin, and chloroquine were also uh, implemented, alongside add-on therapies such as uh, add-on therapies with uh, drugs such as fluoxetine, monopiravir, and Paxlovid. Furthermore, emergency use authorization of certain drugs such as remdesivir, dexamethasone, and monoclonal antibodies was also envisaged in order to curb uh, this uh, pandemic. But besides these measures. Vaccine candidates, or should I say research for vaccine candidates, was also greatly encouraged worldwide. And as a result of that, we had quite a lot of, we have currently quite a lot of uh, vaccines, which are either uh, RNA vaccines or DNA vaccines or even live vaccines that are currently rolled out uh, globally. But unfortunately, all these measures so far are still ineffective in totally curbing down uh, COVID-19. And this is mostly because of uh, the movements of humans and asymptomatic carriers and the emergence of mutant strains, which are what, which are what we call uh, variants of concern. So in order to effectively uh, curb down this pandemic, there's a, a, a dire need to look for alternative uh, 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 therapeutic methods or alternative antivirals that are effective against SARS-CoV-2 uh, variants of concern and other respiratory uh, viruses. And in this case, in this, for, and in, this um, in view of that, in this slide, 
Nanotechnology has therefore emerged as an attractive uh, therapeutic strategy for many infections, such as uh, COVID-19. And plants appear to be, uh, besides the fact that they are food, primary food sources, they appear to be effective uh, alternatives in combating uh, such diseases. Uh, nano, looking at the properties of nanoparticles, these are materials with a varying size of 1 to 1,000 uh, nano, uh, nanometers. They have unique properties, including appropriate size, ID shape, surface charge that can be tuned, high solubility, ease of synthesis, super uh, paramagnetism, increased surface plasma resonance, high bioavailability, high biocompatibility, high immunocompatibility, high tolerability, high biodegradability, and photon upconversion. But moreover, nanoparticles exhibit a slow release mechanism and enhanced retention inside targeted uh, tissues. And because of these properties, nanoparticles are considered as innovative tools that can enhance the delivery of several therapeutic formulations, such as vaccines and drugs. And several types of nanotract structures have been synthesized so far as antiviral substances against uh, coronaviruses. And as illustrated in this diagram here, just to mention a few ones amongst them, you have lipid nanocarriers and nano, nanospheres and graphene sheets, for instance, that have been used so far to design uh, specific uh, drugs and vaccines against um, uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, so far. Now, looking at the nanostructures that have been designed so far against SARS-CoV-2, uh, antiviral metal nanoparticles bind to the surface of viruses, preventing them from attaching to host cell receptors, and they interfere with the early stages of viral replication and suppress free virions. And additionally, metal nanoparticles have anti-inflammatory activities and immunomodulatory characteristics, which may considerably help to prevent the development of a cytokine storm, which is one of the, 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 the most observable, uh, shall I say, um, uh, uh, immune reactions that happen in the body when uh, one gets uh, when gets infected by the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So amongst uh, nanoparticles that were proven to inhibit SARS-CoV-2 and other viruses such as HSV and HIV, as also uh, mentioned in the previous uh, presentations here, you have silver nanoparticles, zinc oxide nanoparticles, and gold uh, nanoparticles, amongst other uh, nanoparticles. I wouldn't want to cite all of them here due to, uh, due to the time that is, uh, that is given to me for this presentation. Now, let's look at some interesting characteristics of plants. So plants produce various secondary metabolites that are involved in their self-defense mechanisms against stress-induced environmental factors and pathogens. And these metabolites are phytochemicals that are extracted either from the bark, the leaves, or the roots of medicinal plants, and they have been used in traditional herbal medicines for centuries to treat various disease uh, conditions. And herbal remedies, individually or in combination, are administered either in formulations such as leaf powder, paste, decoctions, infusions, or peels. Plant extracts are phytochemicals, and these include flavonoids, teponoids, organosulfur compounds, amongst others. Now, interesting characteristics of plants, most uh, phytochemicals are antimicrobial agents. Although molecular pathways related to the antiviral effect of plant extract may vary from virus to virus, their infinite range of chemical constituents is an interesting feature for the inhibition of both DNA and RNA viruses. And the main viral controlling uh, mechanisms of biotic compounds in medicinal plants may include their antioxidant activity, their scavenging ability, the fact that they can in inhibit uh, DNA or RNA synthesis, the fact that they can inhibit viral entry or even viral uh, reproduction. Uh, furthermore, plant extracts are ideal for the biosynthesis of nanoparticles, which is an eco-friendly, easy and cost-effective method of producing nanoparticles with minimal impacts on the environment. But moreover, the various polyphenols and proteins that are contained in plants are as they can act as reducing agents, which make the biosynthesis process less toxic when compared to metallic compounds, which may be hazardous. Now here, uh, these are some medicinal plants that have uh, antiviral uh, properties. Of course, there are hundreds and thousands of plants, but here we just selected a few ones that, uh, that we just to, to, to illustrate what we want to talk about here. The first plant here is properties against uh, VSV, HSV, HPV and H1N1. The other plant that I personally would like to maybe take a look at would be uh, the, the would be garlic, which is uh, which uh, whose uh, scientific name is Allium sativum, and it has properties against uh, the MEV, 
the HSV, HIV, and the SARS-CoV and dengue fever uh, viruses. Also, I'd like to um, maybe uh, say something about uh, uh, Ninja, which is called Zinjiba officinale, which has properties against uh, HSV and SARS-CoV virus. Moreover, I also like to uh, mention uh, cotton, cotton whose name is Gossipium herbaceum, which has properties that, uh, I mean, which is effective against HIV-1, HSV-2, and yellow uh, fever uh, viruses. But out of these plants, let's look now at some of uh, uh, these plants with antiviral properties against SARS-CoV-2. And uh, once again, I'll focus on uh, garlic and ginger, maybe because uh, these two uh, plants are, or should I say these two uh, items, are uh, maybe a, a part of um, the spices that we used mostly in uh, West African foods, which, you, which is where I come from. So besides uh, garlic and, and, uh, and uh, ginger, you also have uh, Wittania somnifera, Tinospora cordifolia, Osimum sanctum, and of course, Azadilacta indica. And uh, here also, you have the, the, the active ingredient that are, that are extracted from these plants that have a specific uh, antiviral um, effect on SARS-CoV-2. In the case of uh, garlic, you have allicin, garlic uh, polysulfanes, and gallicin. And in the case of um, azadilacta indica or the neem uh, plant, you have gallic acid, nimdiol, azadilactin, and so on and so forth. Now let's focus a little bit on azadilacta indica, which, according to us in our research group, is a potential capping agent for antiviral uh, nanoparticles against SARS CoV 2. So Azadiata indica belongs to uh, the Miliaceae family, which is commonly found in tropical Africa, in Pakistan, in Nepal, in Bangladesh, and in India. It is a tree that grows fast, reaching uh, 20 to 23 meters in height, with a trunk diameter of 4 to 5 feet. And it produces a green droop fruit that become golden uh, yellow when ripe, as is illustrated uh, here on this uh, picture. Limb parts such as the leaves, uh, the fruit, the seeds, and the bark contain various active ingredients that have therapeutic uh, properties against a wide variety of uh, disease conditions. For instance, neem seed uh, oil is effective against cancer cell proliferation as its constituents activate tumor suppressor genes and inactivate genes that are involved in cancer proliferation. Uh, it also enhances apoptosis, elimination of the NFKB signaling uh, pathway and the cyclooxygenase uh, pathway. So furthermore, uh, as a director indica leaves seeds and bark extract, have anti-inflammatory, antiparietic, and anti-diabetic properties. They also produce hepatoprotective effects. They have wound healing properties. They, they display immunomodulatory and growth promoting effect as well as anti-nephrotic uh, activities. Most importantly, as a director indica extras have inhibitory effects on microbial growth through uh, the initiation of cell membrane lysis. And as a directing is the most important biotic uh, compound of limb plant extract. It is a tetranol, tetepinoic, limonoid, sorry, which is present mostly in the seeds. And uh, besides as a, as a, as a dilactin, you also have other active ingredients that have uh, biomedical um, activities that are very, that are relevant, like 17-hydroxy uh, as a diradion, uh, salanin, gedonin, quercetin, nimbidol, nimbanjo, and so on and so forth. So several studies have demonstrated the free radical uh, scavenging properties of some of the of most of these uh, biotic uh, compounds. Now this table is a summary of the main uh, phytochemicals of biomedical importance that are, ex that are present in uh, neem or azadilata indica extract. And um, if we look at azadilatin, azadilatin is mostly uh, isolated from extracts that come from the seeds or the bark of the plant. And besides the anti-tumor and anti-malarial properties that it has, it also has antiviral properties against uh, SARS-CoV-2 and other viruses, of course. Besides azadilatin, uh, other um, compounds that have antiviral uh, properties are quercetin, which is extracted from, from the seeds. You also have um, uh, 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 gelinin, which is also extracted from the seeds, which also has antiviral uh, properties. And besides these ones, you, you, you have uh, nimbiol, which is extracted from the seeds and the leaves. You have nimbosinol, which is extracted from the seeds and leaves. And in fact, in, the, in a nutshell, most of these uh, uh, phytochemicals have uh, properties of biomedical importance. And uh, looking at the phytochemicals of azadiata uh, indica extract with anti-SARS-CoV-2 properties, uh, their, their effect 
as inhibitors of SARS-CoV-2 has mostly been investigated uh, through molecular docking studies worldwide. And these studies reveal that they exhibit a strong and stable interaction with active site amino acid residues of SARS-CoV-2 main uh, proteases that are involved in their attachment to the host cell receptor and replication. And furthermore, vitamin C, which is also uh, uh, one of the, which is also present in the uh, uh, limb extract, enhances recovery in COVID-19 patients as a result of its uh, immunomodulatory, modul immunomodulatory uh, properties, sorry. So this is to say that uh, this molecular docking uh, studies uh, 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 result highlight the fact that all these phytochemicals are, will be uh, ideal in the synthesis, in the biosynthesis or as capping uh, agents uh, for uh, bi bi biologically synthesized uh, nanoparticles. So in conclusion, uh, COVID-19 so far has been managed by prescribing uh, medication to address clinical symptoms and by using mechanical ventilation to support the respiratory systems of those who were severely ill. The development of safe but compatible treatment options that will inhibit the virus will be a tremendous uh, advancement for mankind. And here, some studies demonstrated, as illustrated here in this uh, presentation, some, some studies demonstrated that the potential of NIM as a previously on that uh, demonstrated, sorry, demonstrated the potential of NIM as a previously untapped source for novel therapeutic, therapeutics, not only against SARS-CoV-2, but also against other potentially highly infectious uh, viruses. So although there is a growing body of exciting evidence that supports the use of uh, NIM as an antimicrobial, additional in vitro and in vivo studies are clearly needed to determine the specific mechanisms of action, the clinical efficacy, and the safety of this plan as a treatment for pathogens of interest. And moreover, the various ongoing studies and the diverse properties of NIM that are discussed here, they may serve as a guide for, uh, to synthesize other antimicrobials that may exist in other herbal panaceas across the globe. So this is uh, clearly a, 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 an, an outlet for any uh, researcher or students that are willing maybe to partake research in the in, in the synthesis of uh, uh, in the biosynthesis of nano uh, particles. So uh, these are the references that I use for this presentation. And thank you everyone for your kind attention. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Fox. Um, we're going to ask the next speaker. I'm going to ask my colleagues to introduce the next speaker. Dr. Foka, can you, can you try to stop sharing so that we allow the other speaker to join? Thank you so much. Wait for the, oh. you must stay, don't go away. You must wait for the Q&A session. All right. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Our next speaker is Dr. Ariana Gazi. She has a PhD in nanotechnology from the University of Trieste, postdoctoral fellow at the University of Padua. She's a lab manager at EMU Nanolab. She will be presenting on the high dimensional immune profile of 2D materials and MXNs. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, could you see my screen? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yes, okay. okay. Uh, thank you for the nice introduction. So, I am Mariana Gazzi, <coughs> postdoctoral fellow at the University of Padua in the Immune Nano Lab of Professor Lucia Gemaldelogu. And today I'm going to talk to you about high dimensional immune profiling of 2D materials and vaccines. So when we study the immune system, we can capture its complexity only by looking at all the cells at the same time. We know that all these populations are able to play a different role in defending our body. So uh, the point is that they really affect the, and govern every aspect of our health. So in my lab, the immune nanolab, we are able to uh, look after 37 cells, subcellular immune cell types, and uh, we do that uh, simultaneously in the same time. How we do that? We use uh, a particular technique, which is the single cell mass cytometry. Single cell mass cytometry was first discovered by uh, Bandura et al. And after uh, 2015, it became uh, really important, significant, expanding our knowledge uh, for what concerns the immunophenotyping of uh, hematopoietic stem cells. So uh, it is like 
works like flow cytometry, but instead of fluorescent labeling tags, we have metal tag, metal tag antibodies that are detected thanks to, the spe to a spectrometer, a mass spectrometer. So uh, thanks to uh, the uh, single cell mass cytometry, we can overcome the limits of flow cytometry, the spectral overlap and, uh, and many other limitations. And we can uh, evaluate uh, a large number of parameters at the same time at the single cell level. So, um, our idea of the immune nanolab is to take advantage of the immune cell interactions with nanomaterials. So imagine to have a tool, a nanomaterial which is able to treat all these immune dysregulations and uh, uh, to use these nanomaterials to uh, stimulate or suppress the immune system responses. So uh, to take advantage of their immune properties in both senses. So the immune activation for, for example, uh, um, immunotherapy or vaccine adjuvants uh, or to treat inflammation or hyper hypersensibility and immune suppression, on the other hand, uh, as uh, uh, an anti-inflammatory uh, therapeutic uh, drug or to, uh, to uh, knock down allergic responses and other um, activi act activities uh, towards the immune system dysregulations. So this is what we call the uh, non-immunity by design concept, which consists in the characterization of nanomaterials uh, based not only on their chemical and physical characterization, but also considering the immune properties of the nanomaterials. So the downregulation or the upregulation of the immune system responses. I have a couple of examples for you. So here we have the immune profiling of graphene by functionalizing the graphene oxide with uh, this nitrogen group, we were able to obtain a, a strong immune activation action, which has um, the specific signature, molecular signature uh, that we have seen with some commercial immunotherapies. Uh, another example uh, concerns uh, the use of uh, two-dimensional transition metal carbides, uh, carbonitrides and nitrides, uh, which we, were, we will call maxines. So maxines are a large family of nanomaterials. Uh, are, uh, were recently discovered by Professor Yuri Gogossi at Drexel University. And uh, we have studied uh, different types of vaccines uh, with uh, this high dimensional uh, immune profiling technique. And we first started with uh, this titanium carbide vaccine, which is one of the most studied vaccines uh, in uh, nanomedicine. So we uh, discovered that uh, this titanium carbide vaccine was able to induce an antiviral and uh, immunomodulatory activity toward uh, the SARS-CoV-2. So we first evaluated the vaccine impact on 17 immune cell types at the single cell level, um, detecting uh, the absence of cytotoxicity in all these subpopulations. After this, we have evaluated the impact of these nanomaterials on the cytokine production, uh, and we detected a strong immune downregulation in all the samples treated with this vaccine. And then uh, we moved on with other vaccine types, which are uh, molybdenum, niobium, and tantalum uh, carbide vaccines. These vaccines were first studied on human and mice immune cells with high dimensional immune profiling techniques like single cell mass cytometry, imaging mass cytometry, and ion beam mass cytometry. We applied a large panel of uh, antibodies, metal tagged antibodies, in order to dissect the impact of these nanomaterials uh, in both, uh, as I was saying before, human and mice. So we first evaluated the viability. Uh, we detected uh, no impairment uh, of the viability in all the, sub the new subpopulations uh, that we have analyzed. After this, we have uh, uh, evaluated the impact on uh, immune cell functionality. Maxine do not affect uh, the uh, impact, the, the functionality of all the cells, all the PBMCs that we have uh, studied. 
And after this, uh, we discovered that we were able to detect uh, these nanomaterials uh, thanks to their masses uh, inside all these subpopulations. And we decided to apply, to apply also the imaging mass cytometry to detect uh, where these nanomaterials were localized inside our cells. And we discovered that these nanomaterials were binding our cells. And to confirm this result, we decided to perform the transmission electron microscopy to see if these nanomaterials were out of the cells or they got internalized inside our samples. And what we discovered was that our nanomaterials were uptaken by the cells. So after this, we decided to move uh, a step forward uh, and uh, we performed uh, the imaging of tissues uh, coming from uh, maxine injected mice. Uh, we performed the analysis on liver, spleen and lung and uh, what we obtained was uh, the tracking of these nanomaterials inside all these tissues. At the end of these uh, uh, tests, we decided also to detect uh, the vaccines at the single cell level, considering uh, the immune subpopulations um, of all the organs analyzed. Then we, we moved a step forward with another vaccine, which is the vanadium carbide vaccine. So among the large family of vanadium of vaccines, the vanadium carbide um, was of particular interest for us, given the presence of vanadium in its structure. So uh, recent in the recent decades, various vanadium compounds have been studied uh, as uh, immune modulator medicines but uh, all of them had in common the cytotoxicity. We know that vanadium is involved in a large number of immune-driven mechanisms that regulate and stimulate our immune system cells. So for this reason, we decided to use the vanadium-based vaccines in order to take advantage of the high biocompatibility of the vaccines family. And to do this, we started with uh, the analysis of vanadium carbide impact on 17 immune primary cell types. Uh, we detected uh, no signs of cytotoxicity in all the populations analyzed. And then we moved a step forward by analyzing cell functionality, taking in consideration two uh, markers of immune activation, CD25 and CD69, early and late activation markers. Uh, as we can see from these graphs, um, vanadium carbide was able to down-regulate uh, the uh, production of these, um, to reduce the production of these activation marker, uh, giving us a uh, um, uh, uh, um, a sign of uh, uh, an immune down-regulatory activity, uh, which was then confirmed also uh, by the analysis of different uh, um, immune uh, activation markers and uh, cytokine, cytokines, which were uh, mod modulated by the presence of vanadium. After this, we decided to uh, detect the presence of vanadium inside our cells. We have taken titanium carbide as a uh, control, as a standard uh, reference. And uh, what we have noticed uh, was that uh, titanium carbide was internalized by our samples uh, instead of vanadium carbide. So we can speculate uh, on uh, the different chemical uh, uh, composition of the two materials that may have affected the internalization of the two materials. Uh, after this, uh, we have uh, um, evaluated the production of uh, 11 cytokines uh, um, reporting uh, an immune downregulation for all the uh, cytokines, uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, uh, which were treated, uh, which were um, uh, evaluated in the samples treated with vanadium carbide. After this, we have performed the RNA sequencing profiling and we found out that immune-related pathways were strongly inhibiting, inhibited following the vanadium carbide stimulation. And these pathways were the T-helper signaling, the interferon signaling, the major histocompatibility complex 1 and 2 genes, and the interferon-inducible chemokines and transcription factors. Um, together also with uh, the molecular signaling downstream uh, T-cell receptor. 
And we found out that also the interleukin-1 was upregulated, which is a down-regulating cytokine for the immune system activation. So uh, we can conclude for the vadanium carbide that uh, it was able uh, to um, induce the inhibition of a particular uh, function of our cells, immune cells, which is the antigen presenting function. So uh, it, uh, it was uh, able to interfere with this uh, um, antigen presenting activity of our cells and we could uh, take advantage of this uh, uh, inter interaction of our nanomaterial uh, cause for, for example, uh, um, the, the treatment of autoimmune diseases. So we hope for the future to, uh, that the knowledge of 2D materials and vaccines immune modulation will, uh, in a certain way, drive the, their use in the biomedical applications. And we hope uh, that our method for the immune phenotyping will, will take place for the uh, characterization, immune characterization of all nanomaterials in the future. I would like to thank uh, all my colleagues at the University of Padua and all the groups uh, we are collaborating uh, uh, here and uh, all of you for your kind attention. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Doc, don't, don't disappear, just stay behind. We're going to pull you again for the session. Yeah, thank you. My colleague is going to introduce yes. our next speaker, uh, Snow Buyo. Can you introduce our next speaker? Our next speaker is Prof. Christian Isalomboto Nganga. He has a PhD in chemistry from York Road University, postdoctoral research in nanoengineering at the University of California, is an associate professor in pharmaceutical sciences at the University of Kinshasa. He will be talking about nanoengineering of tobacco mosaic virus for bioimaging and photothermal immunotherapy of melanoma. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Prof. For the invite. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, yes, you can see your screen. Okay, let me just go to slide mode. Are you joining us from DRC or are you in, in the USA? Right now I'm in the United States. So thank no, you again for the invite. And um, no, okay. it's actually Welcome. great to be around and talk about um, our efforts to modify the tobacco mosaic virus um, as a platform nanotechnology for the design of, of photothermal immunotherapeutic agents. In this case, um, we're talking about the melanoma treatment, but it's a platform that we have developed in the past and tried to. We already started for bioimaging capabilities when we started the biodistribution and the pharmacokinetics of the, the, the system. But in this presentation, I will be focusing essentially on the melanoma treatment. So, just a quick introduction. So, melanoma is basically um, the tumor of melanocytes. So these are like the skin kind of cells that produce the, the skin pigment, the melanin. And this image here shows how the melanoma cells colonize the, the, the skin layer. So across all the skin layers, including the dermal layer. And what is particularly interesting about melanoma is that it only represents 1% of the skin cancers, but when you look at the deaths due to skin cancers, it's actually the top, like 65% of deaths due to melanoma, due to skin cancers are caused by melanoma. So it's a very malignant and highly cancerous tumor and giving only 5% of survival rate. So uh, it's a very um, problematic disease and this is basically essentially because of the recurrence, because with the existing uh, treatment options, basically surgery, et cetera, you can easily debark the tumor from the skin, but then the major problem is the recurrence, which would happen either locally or in distant organs as, metastas um, as metastasis. So that's where the photothermal treatment stands as a promising strategy 
because it can not only it can it can not only debark debark remove the tumor, but it can also um, boost or prime the anti-tumor response and provide a further control over the disease progression as a recurrence. And this is how it works. The photo in photothermal therapy, we basically use a, a substance that is able to convert a near infrared light into um, heat locally. So you would inject your formulation. Basically, this is in this case, it's um, andocyanine green dye that was used, injected to the mice, and then through uh, EPR effect. So the nanoparticles will be homed within within the within the tumor mass, and they would shine light after some time, and then the light will be converted into heat locally, and that will be the the. the that heat, that local heat will be killing the, the tumor cells. And one advantage with photothermal therapy is that, yes, the mass, the tumor will be burned off, but then the dying cells would be displaying some antigen associated um, antigen, which would then um, prime the anti tumor immunity. And we see in the scheme here the, the, how it works. We have the tumor cells burned off then they would display the tumor-associated antigens, and those antigens, they would then prime the maturation or activation of uh, dendritic cells, leading to activation and production and T cells. And some of the T cells will be producing um, pro-inflammatory cytokines or chemokines, and then leading to uh, a T cell response ultimately, um, which will have some um, cytotoxic effect towards the cancer cells. So in the future, they will be able, those activated immune cells would be able to fight against um, metastasis and prevent um, tum the tumor recurrence. However, this is mostly perfect. It looks more perfect theoretically, but then if we go to real life world, it turns out that in most studies, um, the anti-tumor immunity due to PTT is not effective enough to fight um, a tumor recurrence. Like, it's quite low. Therefore, many efforts have been done to try to improve the, human, um, the humanity, the, the, to try to combine photothermal therapy with um, immunogenic agents to try to um, support um, the, the treatment side against the, the metastasis or recurrence in general. And many studies have been done so far, injecting nanoparticles for photothermal therapy, and then later on, or side by side, progressively injecting um, the immunotherapeutic or immunogenic agent to boost, to support the anti-tumor, anti-metastatic activity further. And these are two examples, so using gold um, um, aluminum oxide nanoparticles combined with, uh, if I recall, some uh, two light -like receptor um, ligand. And here they will combine um, polydopamine coated nanoparticles, no, gold nanoparticles with adoptive cell transfer. So injecting T cells actively after phototherapy, photothermal therapy, and that's where they were able to achieve um, eradication of melanoma. In our case, we consider the rather developing a one for all um, nanoparticle achieving both photothermal therapy but also immunotherapy. And for that, we've considered um, working with plant viruses as immunogenic agents because naturally they are immunogenic. And in the, at the lab of Professor Steinman at the University of California, San Diego, they are working on repurposing plant viruses as a platform nanotechnology. And given several advantages of plant viruses, such as high biodegradability, biocompatibility, they cannot, uh, they are not able to replicate in mammalian cells. They can be massively produced uh, through molecular forming or fermentation. And they've got like with plant viruses production, if you make no particles out of them, you will be able to have a good control over uh, the quality of the product because you've got high homogeneity because the each particle is basically the clone of the other. So they really look like size-wise and shape-wise. And they also over, they also amenable 
due to chemical modifications, and especially the tobacco mosaic virus is an, ex an exceptional plant virus in terms of chemical modification because they can it can withstand several rounds of chemical modifications, and it also shows um, the ability to easily penetrate the tissues is, and provide excellent tumor homing. And think of a needle penetrating tissue. So that's why we selected the tobacco mosaic virus for this study. And for characteristics, you can write down that it's uh, made up of a 2001 theory protein unit forming a nucleocapsid and a root of a road shape, 300 nanometer size and, and lengthwise and 18 nanometers and width diameter. And with it's got like an internal channel where the, the, the RNA is uh, trapped inside. So the characteristics of tobacco mosaic virus is quite interesting because it allows, it enables you to basically attach your cargos either internally or externally. And in this case, we used the tobacco mosaic virus as a, a platform, as a vehicle first, eventually, but mostly because it's known to have some immunogenicity. So it's immunogenic, so we're hoping that it would support the immunotherapeutic components of the treatment. And on the other side, because it, has, it does not have any photothermal property, we, have to, we had to add up an additional component, which in this case we worked with uh, polydopamine, which is easily synthesized through poly oxidative polymerization of dopamine. So we have got um, room temperature reaction, oops, sorry. And then the polydopamine will be formed. And the advantage of polydopamine is that it gathers a quite a number of uh, photo activities, including um, excellent photothermal capability. It's able to convert light into heat and also photoacoustic properties. And we have used um, the polydopamine coated um, tobacco mosaic virus in the past for imaging studies uh, to study about distribution, how much that coat uh, affect the distribution of the of the, the, the particles. And I, I'm not discussing about that here, but here I'm mostly focusing on, on I'm sorry, I lost my, I lost this slide. Okay, let's see. Oh, okay. Here yeah, I'm focusing on the photothermal capability rather. So this is how we made um, the polydopamine, I will be calling it PDA, polydopamine coated TMV for tobacco mosaic virus. So basically, as I said, so room temperature reaction makes a dopamine a pH 8 alkaline pH with uh, the, the TMV, tobacco mosaic virus. And then after a couple of hours, you would have your power poles and then around a couple of um, washing, centrifugation, high speed centrifugation will be able to get you to, to allow you to isolate the particles. And as you can see from the transmission electron microscopy data, TMV itself, it's smooth. The surface of TMV is quite smooth. While the surface of TMV coated particles with polydopamine is quite rough. And that's because of the presence of the polydopamine. And to further confirm that we successfully coated TMV with polydopamine, we, ended, we conducted um, photothermal um, fish conversion studies using the near infrared, infrared lights, 800 nanometer, 808 nanometers. And then we were able to see that the lights, the, the, the local temperature of the solution increases as the concentration of the, the, the particles also increases. So it confirms that in fact, indeed, the polydopamine was um, successfully coated on the surface of the, the tobacco mosaic virus and we could have a good photothermal conversion efficiency, which was actually similar to um, a golden particle even more slightly when you compare, but I'm not showing the data here. And this is uh, a cycle of laser on and off um, and heating behavior to study how much the particles are able to, continue to remain, are still able to convert light into heat after cooling, a couple of cooling and heating cycles. You can see after 10 minutes heating, the temperature increases. We let it, we turn off the laser, the temperature goes down. After 10 minutes again, we heat, and then so the particles were still able to, um, to, con to re remain active in terms of photothermal uh, conversion. 
And then after coating successfully the tobacco mosaic varies with uh, polydopamine, we were like, okay, let's try now to do photothermal uh, treatment of melanoma mice models. And I'm just briefly giving you a brief idea of what we saw preliminary, and then I will go into the details, uh, the more detailed study later. So basically, we injected, we designed, uh, we uh, trigger, we provoked cancer in uh, black mice with uh, the B16F10. And then after we established the tumor, after eight days, we injected the product. And then one day later, we irradiated the, the infrared, near infrared light. And then we followed the treatment over time using part, um, tumor size measurement and the body weight variation. And most particularly, looking up the survival rate. And unfortunately, at this point, we didn't see big difference between the particles that were um, the mice that were treated with particles and irradiated versus the particles that were not the mice that were not irradiated at all. Like the particles itself would also give some activity. As a result, at the end of the day, the survival, the maiden survival rate was quite similar. So not much difference between the two. There was a difference between the treatment groups and the control, yes, but between the different groups, there were there was no significant difference. So this means that the tobacco mosaic virus itself was not strongly immunogenic, sufficiently immunogenic to support the photothermal therapy. therapy. So next, we decided to now equip the tobacco mosaic virus with an immunomodulatory agent as a, an adjuvant. In this case, we choose uh, to work with a TLR7 agonist, a two-like receptor <coughs> agonist called 1V209. And we had to conjugate it internally in, inside of the, 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 the tobacco mosaic virus. As I said, we have got in a four nanometer channel where we've got a couple of uh, reactive chemical handles from the amino acid, particularly glutamates. So we were able to modify first um, the glutamate moiety of um, the tobacco mosaic virus by adding um, propagyl um, in mind, so basically alkyne labeling the internal phase of the virus to have this. Then on the other side, we also slightly modified the drug, the, the TLR agonist, with an azide handle. So this is an azide lab.